And you're joining us this week midway through this series on the Gospel of Mark. And basically, we're reading through the Gospel of Mark. We're on this journey through this book. And it takes us from Christmas, the manger, all the way to Easter with the cross. And this back wall is sort of a map of the book of Mark, right? Each one of those icons is a different message in this series as we work through this book together. And today, this morning, we are exactly halfway through this sermon series. And that also coincides that we are halfway through the book of Mark. Today marks that halfway point. And there's a key transition, a transformation that happens in the Gospel of Mark at this moment, in today's passage. Something happens this morning that radically transforms the rest of the book, right? In fact, Bible scholars, if you were to pull up commentaries and start, start reading different insights, people who've studied the Gospel of Mark their whole lives, one of the things that they would often point out is that the exact moment In fact, when this transformation happens, this key inflection moment in the Gospel of Mark, and that key moment is Mark chapter 8, verse 29. We'll read it in a few minutes. And even if you were to look at our wall, this back map on the wall, right, you would even notice that there's, there's something significant that happens in the moment today because The next few messages are literally skull and crossbones. Three in a row, right? Something happens today. Something big. And, good news, I'm not going to make you wait to the very end of this message to find out what it is. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Uh, Isn't that nice, right? Here's the decisive moment, the life-altering moment in today's passage. You get to hear it in the very beginning. Are you ready? Jesus asks his disciples a key question. It's Mark 8, 29. He says to them, but what about you? He asks, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. It's almost like there's this fork in the road that's coming at the end of this passage, right? Where we're faced with this critical decision. If we're, if we're thinking of the, the Gospel of Mark like a journey, right? There is a fork in the road. And that fork curves around this question. That critical question that alters the course of our life. Who is Jesus to us? And that question is where this passage eventually leads this morning, right? It's it's some of the closing verses that we're going to be reading. And one day Jesus will ask each one of us that very question. Who am I to you? Now this morning, this message will, will likely feel a little bit different. Okay, this message is going to feel different than some of the other messages in this series because you already know where we're headed. I just read it for you, right? We already know the ending to this sermon. Um, And I told you the ending already because really our emphasis this morning is going to be on actually what happens leading up to this critical moment, this critical fork in the road. This morning's passage is the story of Jesus' followers coming to realize who Jesus is. This is the story of Jesus' followers coming to realize who Jesus is. So part of what makes this morning's message unique is that uh, probably half of our time this morning, right? I'm just going to literally be reading scripture to you. We're just going to be reading these passages. And so far, this message, um, you, could, you could almost imagine that this message is going to be more like me being a tour guide, okay? I'm going to read some scripture, and I'll point out a few observations. And then we're going to walk over here, we're going to keep walking, right? I'm going to read a, a little bit more scripture. We're going to keep moving through the passage, and then we'll pause here and there to point out some observations. If you've ever been to like... An art museum. I remember going to the Chicago Art Museum, and if you had a tour guide before, right, they kind of walk you through, and they kind of like look at this one, and then a few observations, and then this one, right? That's kind of what we're going to do through this passage. And the reason why we're approaching Mark 7, verses 31 
through, through 8.30 uh, in this way is because this passage is an absolute masterpiece. It's a masterpiece, right? T- today's passage is, is on the level of a, of a Da Vinci or a Rembrandt or even a Van Gogh, right? Um, Mark 7, verse 31 through 8.30 is an absolute masterpiece, exquisite, like perfection. But sometimes it takes a tour guide to walk you through the museum, right, and point out a few observations before we really see and understand the flawless masterpiece that we're looking at, right? Hence, this morning, hi, I'm Michael, right, and I'll be your tour guide through this morning's passage. Um, And maybe you've been to one of those museum tours before, and oftentimes if you've been to one of those museum tours, right, they kind of start in the lobby, in the front area, and what ends up happening is the tour guide starts out and they sort of give you some big picture information, a little bit of context, right? They tell you broadly some of the things you're going to be seeing in this tour ahead so that you're ready. So with that in mind, Welcome to our tour through Mark chapter 7, verse 31 through 8, 30. You can start turning there, getting ready. We'll start in a couple minutes. Um, But let me start by telling you the big picture. Let me start, before we start walking through this passage, let me show you the big picture that's going to be unfolded this morning. So I've got some visual aids to help you, right? I'll end up putting them on the screen, but I want to start by just pointing out for you, okay, a theme that's running all through the passage we're going to be reading, but is just underneath the surface. In fact, I bet there's some of you who have read this passage your whole life and never picked up on this key theme. It's just below the surface. So uh, our passage that we'll be reading this morning, um, I want you to notice, we'll put it up on the slides, right? That there's sort of this structure. And, And the structure to it is there's a miracle, then a misunderstanding, and then a question that Jesus asks. And there's a theme that runs through all of that, right? There's a theme to the miracle, the misunderstanding, and the question. And it all has to do with ears, with hearing, right? So, for example, they all orbit this theme of hearing. Um, So I have an ear up there to kind of remind you, visual, visual cue, right? So the miracle, lo and behold, Jesus heals a deaf man. Oh, okay. And then the misunderstanding is that the disciples can't comprehend Jesus' words. Jesus says something, right? And the disciples struggle to hear and understand what Jesus is saying to them. And then the question emerges, right? Jesus asks, do you still not understand? Do you you have ears but fail to hear? Okay, so part of this morning's passage, right? A portion of this morning's passage is, is, is highlighted up there for you, but there's actually a second half to this morning's passage. So the first half kind of looks like that. The first portion looks like that. And there's this theme running just below the surface of the first half. And there's also a theme running below just the surface of the second half of this morning's passage. And this morning's passage, the second portion, is remarkably similar to the first half. They actually have the same features, right? So we'll put it up there on the screen, and uh, that second half, it has a miracle, a misunderstanding, and a question. Oh, almost that same structure. Except the miracle, the misunderstanding, and the question on the second portion all have to do with eyes and sight. Hmm. So for example, the miracle... Jesus heals a blind man. Oh. And then the misunderstanding, the crowd, uh, the crowds that are following Jesus, these disciples who have been gathered around him, right? They're, they've been following and watching Jesus, seeing Jesus, and the crowds, yet they're failing to see and recognize who Jesus is. They're failing to see Jesus' identity. There's this misunderstanding. And so it leads to a question, right? And Jesus asks, who do you say I am? Do you see and recognize who I am? 
Okay, we've laid out the big picture for you. You, you know what's coming in store. You can see the big theme that's unfolding, the background of our passage. But there is one last big picture observation I want to point out for you. Because this theme that's running all through our passage this morning in Mark, right? That's a theme, you know, eyes to see, ears to hear. That's, that's sort of a familiar melody in Scripture. In fact, that exact melody plays in other books. The same things we're going to see this morning, they actually, they're actually in books like Isaiah, this, this whole idea of eyes to see, ears to hear. So check it out. I'll throw it up there for you so you're a little familiar with it, right? Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 through 10 say the following. He said, God said, right, in that context, God said, go and tell this people. Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, right? There's this challenge in there. Otherwise, man, if only. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes. They might hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed, right? So there's a bit of suspense in this passage, right? There's some suspense with those words. They're kind of unsettling almost, right? Oh man, it, it almost brings to mind this picture of like, if only they would have eyes to see, if only they would have ears to see, they would turn and be healed. And the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament, right? This is, this is one of the times he plays the melody. He actually plays this melody a bunch of times through the book of Isaiah. And later on in the book of Isaiah, he talks about eyes to see and ears to hear, but it's a little bit different. He starts talking about this Messiah, this one who is to come. And check out what he says when he plays the melody again later on in the book. Isaiah 35, five through six says the following. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened. Right before it was saying, oh man, if only their eyes could be opened. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Whoa, right? So, so when we first read in, in, in chapter six, it was sort of unsettling like, oh man, if only their, their ears and eyes could be opened. And then we hear about how this Messiah is coming Something's going to happen, and it's going to be changed. This Messiah is going to come, and he's going to open eyes and, and unstop ears. And people will be able to see and hear. So we're picking up on this theme that's, that's running through Mark, and we're seeing that this is a theme that's familiar throughout the Bible. Um, we've got the big picture under our belt, right? So this was like the intro at the, like the lobby of the museum, right? The tour guide, hello. Um, and, and now we can appreciate some of the themes we're going to see as we walk through this passage. So let's start walking through. So come along with me. Uh, Mark chapter 7, verses 31 through 37. And I'll read them for you. Then Jesus lift, left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There, some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged Jesus to place his hands on them. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven with a deep sigh, said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened and his tongue was loosened and began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Okay, so we just read the first miracle, right? In that structure we just looked at, the miracle with the ears, right? The ears of the deaf are unstopped. And it's sort of interesting, even the visual picture of what happens in this passage, right? Jesus literally takes his fingers and like, like, it's almost a picture of like he pierces the man's ears with his fingers, right? He unstops his ears. 
But I want to draw special attention to something unusual that's in this passage. Uh, Because this particular guy wasn't only deaf. Something else was happening wrapped up in this passage. So look closer with me. Mark chapter 7, verse 32. There, some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. He had a stutter. He could hardly talk, a stammer. And they begged Jesus to place his hands on him. Now, I'm drawing special attention to that phrase, could hardly talk, okay? And and the reason is, is because that whole English phrase, right, could hardly talk, is actually one word in Greek. One word in the original language, right? Um, uh, and it's the word magilalos. Magilalos, okay? Now you know Greek. And that Greek word could hardly talk. That is a totally bizarre and unusual word. Magilalos. In fact, that is not the normal word that would be used in like a context like this, right? This is a bizarre, weird occurrence of this word. Um, Magi lalas. In fact, this word in this passage is so unusual. It's not used anywhere else in the Bible. Actually, that's not true. Wait, that's not true, right? There is one other place in the entire Bible that that word is used. Magilalas. You want to see the only other occurrence of that word in the entire Bible? Uh, I'll show it to you. Here it is. All right? Well, looky here. Isaiah 35, 5 through 6. Then the eyes of the blind will be open, the ears of the deaf unstopped, Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the magilalas shout for joy. Only other time in the entire Bible that word appears. And and really quickly, did you notice that Mark made a huge deal? What we just read in that passage of Mark, he made a huge deal. He even said it in Aramaic, epiphathos, right? Be opened. Like he made a big deal out of those particular words, those exact words words because Jesus is reciting the exact words from this psalm for, or from this, this passage. Verse 5, right? The eyes of the blind will be opened. And maybe you're saying, Michael, I'm a bit confused, right? Jesus recites the words, be open, right? But Jesus puts his, his fingers in the deaf man's ears and they become unstopped And that makes sense, but why did Jesus recite the very words, be opened, the command for the eyes of the blind to be opened, when there's no blind person in this story? Right? That's correct. There's no blind person in this story, reader, right? There isn't a blind person in the story, nudge, nudge, right? Um, Okay, so we can start... Uh, at the start of this message, right? I kind of warned you and I I told you that, uh, man, this is a masterpiece, this section of Mark. And maybe some of you didn't take me quite seriously. That's okay, right? Michael, you say that stuff all the time. But we're only seven verses in, right? And I hope your eyes are beginning to open because we haven't even really gotten to the good stuff yet. So let's keep this tour moving, okay? Mark chapter eight, verses one through 12. I'll read it for you. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they'll collapse on the way because some of them have come a great distance. Verse 4, his disciples answered, But where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. And they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and and told his disciples to distribute them. 
The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. After he had sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of uh, Dalmantha. Verse 11, the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus, to test him. They asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a sign? I tell you, no one, no sign will be given to it. So Jesus has been performing miracles all through the Gospel of Mark, right? This is not the first miracle we've heard about, but yet this is another big miracle moment. He just fed 4,000 people, right? But yet the Pharisees are seemingly oblivious. He just fed 4,000 people, right? And they want a sign, a sign. Man, If only Jesus, you would just give me a sign. If only Jesus, you would just prove to me that you're real. And it's like, man, how could the Pharisees be missing what's right in front of their face, right? They've been watching Jesus work miracles. If only I had a sign. Man, it's almost ironic, right? It's almost ironic. Looking at the Pharisees, he just fed 4,000 people and he said, he, they're coming to him testing, can we have a sign? Jesus, will you show us a sign? Will you, will you show us something that only God could do? Man, are the Pharisees like blind, right? Yes, in fact they are. Sure, their physical eyes might be working perfectly well, right? They can physically see, but their hearts are calloused. And blind. They're not recognizing the miracles that are happening all around them, right? What they need is not actually a sign, right? There's signs all around. It would do them no good. There's miracles and evidence all around their lives. What they need is for their eyes to be opened and their ears to be unstopped. So I guess it sort of makes sense what's going on in this passage so far. But let's keep moving, right? Let's see what's up next. Let's see what Mark has in store for us in verse 13 through 21 of chapter 8. Verse 13. Then he left them, Jesus left them, got back into the boat and crossed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Side note, kind of funny, right? They had like seven full basketfuls, and they forgot, like, who left the basketfuls of bread? Okay, they only had one loaf of bread that they had with them in the boat. Verse 15, be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed with each other, one another, and said, it's because we have no bread. Like, it's because we forgot the bread. Verse 17, aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many basketfuls basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? 12, they replied. And and when I broke seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? Now, I'm not going to point out everything, all the little observations in this passage. I just want you to realize, though, that like these are Jesus' close 12 disciples, and they've been following Jesus for quite a while, and even they are struggling in this moment, right? The 12 disciples, man, they they have witnessed miracles firsthand, right? Like maybe you've witnessed miracles in your life firsthand. 
Maybe, maybe you've seen God do something incredible in your life, but yet, even Jesus' disciples can struggle to see. Verse 17, do you still not see or understand? It's as if this passage, right, what's happening, like a, a picture that we could have of what's going on in this passage in our mind, it's like the disciples are starting to realize who Jesus is, like their eyesight is, is partially returning to them, but things are still blurry, as it were, right? Their heart is still not seeing clearly. It's like the disciples are looking at Jesus, right, and they can they can see there's something there, but who is this exactly? Who are you exactly, Jesus? It's still blurry. Is that a person? Is that a tree? Like, I'm not sure exactly what I'm looking at. Jesus' disciples' hearts are starting to be able to see, but something more needs to happen. They're still not seeing clearly who Jesus is. So let's, let's see where this, this Gospel of Mark takes us next. Let's keep reading. Verses 22 through 26 of chapter 8. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes... And put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? Verse 24, he looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around, right? He can can kind of start to see, but it's blurry, right? Verse 25, once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored. And he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. I want you to realize that, man, that passage, where it's placed, what it's saying, its very structure is deliberate, right? Sometimes maybe some of us have studied through the Gospel of Mark before, and this is a confusing passage. We've said, why didn't Jesus just heal the man like, boom, in one touch? Like, why was there this two phases, right? And maybe it never really made sense before. And that's what happens if we read that passage in isolation. Uh, Man, that passage is a portion of a greater masterpiece. And that passage that we just read, it's foreshadowing. It's preparing us. It's loaded with foreshadowing, right? The suspense is building, right? Jesus already commanded the eyes to be opened, right? That was, that was one of the first parts we read. He commanded the eyes to be opened, but maybe we're still not seeing clearly. Man, maybe it's still a little bit blurry. And believe it or not, Uh, this text is trying to mess with you, right? It's almost like this text is like reaching out from the page, trying to pull you into the story, as we'll see. So let's finish off this section. The last portion of our passage this morning, Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 30. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. Verse 29, But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Man, he says, You are that guy from Isaiah 35. You are the Messiah. Verse 30, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. The Gospel of Mark, as we think about it, it records the events of Jesus and his disciples, right? But the Gospel of Mark was not written for Peter. The Gospel of Mark was was not written for James or John. And the Gospel of Mark was, was not actually written for any of the characters in this story. 
this book was written for you. This book was written to you. And maybe you noticed a bit of the masterpiece behind Mark's words, right? The words seem to lift right off the page and start to grab us, right? It's as if Jesus was, was to come and ask us, right? Who do people say I am? Well, that's exactly what we just read, right? We, we heard some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and even others like Peter say, Jesus, you're the Messiah, right? So if Jesus was to come and ask us, who do people say I am? We could point down to the very words of this page. But if, what if Jesus was to say to us, but what about you? Who do you say I am? How would you answer him? Friends, this is the key turning point of the Gospel of Mark. It's sort of the fork in the road. I actually warned you earlier in this message that this, this was the exact ending. Um, how is it right, that this ending sort of snuck up on us, right? That critical question, who is Jesus to us? Here's what I want you to do right now. Um, grab your bulletin or a scratch piece of paper, grab a pen, or you can use your phone, type it out on your phone, but I want you somewhere to write down the answer to this question. And what you write down is just for you, right? Is for you and Jesus. And here's what I want you to answer. Who is Jesus to you? This isn't for anybody else. That's the question that's been foreshadowed all through this morning's passage, that critical question. Who is Jesus to us? So take a couple minutes and, and go ahead and write down, uh, man, your answer. or maybe finish in writing down how you would respond to Jesus if he was to ask you that question. Um, maybe the answer you wrote down was something similar to Peter's answer. Maybe you responded, man, Jesus, your Lord, Messiah, Christ, Savior, King. Um, if your answer was something along the lines of maybe what Peter answered, right? Here's what I want you to do. I want you right underneath your answer, what you wrote down, I want you to write the name of a person that you know doesn't know how to answer that question. I want you to write down the name of a friend or family member, coworker, whoever. I want you to write the name of a person who does not know how to answer the question, who is Jesus to you? This week, I want you to be praying every day for that person. And, and pray that just that God would do something powerful in their life. A, a prayer, man, for that friend who doesn't know. And, 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 and pray that, man, their eyes would be opened and their ears would be unstopped. Because friends, that's exactly what Jesus came to do. Now, I know there are others maybe in this room as you wrote down your, your answer, maybe you were feeling a little uncomfortable, right? Maybe you were a little unresolved, unclear, uncertain. Maybe, maybe your answer even had a question mark at the end of it. Uh, maybe you're at that point where you're, you're starting to see, but it's still hazy, blurry. I'm still not quite sure exactly who Jesus is. It's not quite clear. Um... Uh, 
if I was a, a betting man, um, you know, oftentimes when we're in that scenario, I'm just not sure. It's not quite clear. Uh, in conversations with people, the thing that often comes up is they'll say, you know, I've been asking God for a sign. Like, God, show me a sign. Reveal to me. Like, make it clear that you're there. And you know, it's always a hard one in those conversations uh, because most of the time, God's been doing incredible things in their life, like miracles left and right. Like even sometimes the conversation we're having is like, are you serious? Like, look at where we're at right now, this conversation we're having, right? This is a miracle right now. They're saying, ah, but if God would only show me a sign, I'd wager if that's where you're at, Jesus has probably been more at work in your life than what you're realizing. And see, your, your prayers, they don't need to be, Jesus, give me a sign, show me. Instead, your prayers need to be, let my eyes be open to see. Let my ears be unstopped to hear. Because so often, just like we saw in this passage, right, the Pharisees and Jesus' disciples alike, right, that Jesus is doing stuff right in front of them. He's, he's speaking right to them, and they're missing it. Remember, Jesus is saying things like, do you still not see or understand? Do you have eyes to see but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? Man, if, if you're not sure how to answer that question, who is Jesus to me, this week, just be praying that Jesus, do whatever you need to do. Let my eyes be open to see and my ears be unstopped to hear. And for the sake of transparency, before you pray that prayer, right? This is my like, my little disclaimer, my warning, right? Um, that's a really dangerous prayer. Sometimes Jesus answers that prayer, and the way he needs to answer it is to make, him front and, make himself front and center in our life. And that takes, and that involves removing a lot of distractions in our life. Sometimes that prayer is answered, and Jesus will take away things in your life so that you can see clearly. I mean, think of the Apostle Paul, right? Book of Acts, like the Apostle Paul, he wrote a huge portion of the Bible, right? But that prayer, let Paul's eyes be open to see you, Jesus. You know how that prayer was answered? Paul actually goes physically blind, right? Sort of makes sense in a weird way because the truth of the matter was his heart was blind all along, right? And Jesus actually takes away Paul's eyesight, to open Paul's eyes so that he could actually see. If you really want to see Jesus at work in your life, I bet he's already working. It's gonna require a dangerous prayer. Jesus, do what you need to do. Let my eyes be open to see and my ears be unstopped to hear. Let's pray together. Father, uh, man, this is a beautiful passage. Um, and this passage is not telling a story. It is telling a story of, of things that were happening with your disciples, but it's, man, it's speaking out to us where we're at. Um, it's a living story. And I just pray that you would be at work in our hearts. So often I can think of friends and names and faces that I've been praying for. God, show them a sign. Do a miracle. Father, I pray right now. Those in this room that maybe aren't seeing clearly, this is the dangerous one. Do whatever you need to do. This week ahead so that we would see clearly, that we'd hear your words. 
that we would see clearly you at work in the ways you've already been at work. How is it that we could have missed this? How is it we could ask for a sign in you? In the verses before, you're feeding 4,000. Man, so often that's our life. Would you open our eyes to see and our ears to hear? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you this week ahead. May his face shine upon you. You're dismissed.